Acts chapter 1. I got something to show you tonight that I still haven't figured out my wireless deal. But anyway, um, somebody called today, a gentleman called, been following us for years. He called and asked me a pretty good question. And um, I don't know why you guys never asked this question. Smart as you guys are, maybe you all know the answers. In fact, I'm going to just go out and ask you. The Catholic Church is the one who gave us the Easter date. And they also gave us what they called Good Friday. And I was actually at Walmart years ago waiting to get a prescription and somebody brought, it was right close to Easter and somebody brought up the, the phrase, yeah, tomorrow's Good Friday. And the, there was a young guy and he said, what is Good Friday anyway? And so I'm standing right behind him and I'm going, oh, I know this one. And I said, Good Friday is supposed to be the day that Jesus Christ was crucified and then the Bible says that he rose again he conquered death and rose again the third day. And he did all this because he loves sinners. And he died for our sins so that we don't have to go to hell when we die. We can go to heaven. Oh. He didn't want to hear no more. The sermon was over. So anyway, I'm going to ask you. Was Jesus crucified on Friday? Who says yes? Well, I can see where all our Catholics are tonight. Who says no? Who says they don't know? There we go. Honesty. I want honesty. So a guy called today, and he was reading, um, where is it, in, in Luke, where Jesus, they, the, the Pharisees and people, they were, they were wanting Jesus to show them a sign. Moses showed their forefathers all the signs they needed. I mean, ten plagues, being released from Pharaoh, the Red Sea, the water coming from a rock, food coming from heaven, um, uh, quails just falling out of the sky, and they, they eat quail until they're sick of it. And um, then all the other miracles that they saw God do for out those 40 plus years that they were wandering in the wilderness. They saw sign after sign after sign after sign and they still had a huge problem following God and believing what he said. So Jesus is like, yeah, that's, that's how us Jews are. And he said, uh, a wicked and adulterous generation always seeketh after a sign. The only sign that shall be given you is the sign of the prophet Jonas meaning Jonah. He said, For as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall it be, at the, uh, so shall it be with the Son of Man. The, or the Son of Man shall be in the heart of the earth. Three days, three nights. I butchered that one. So anyway, um, he asked me, he said, he said, I don't get it. He said, if you start on Friday, it don't work. So I... Uh, told him a little bit about what I thought and I tried to get him to picture it in his mind and uh, so I thought maybe I'll come up with a these now this is high intensity graphics this is 4k graphics right here okay the software to do this costs thousands of dollars <clears throat> actually I just downloaded the March sign there stuck it up there all right so picture Here's how I got it figured. Picture Christ. He's being crucified on Thursday. Okay? And his crucifixion goes, I think, from the third hour of the day to the twelfth hour, 6 p.m. They got to get him down before dark. Jews always regarded in their calendars, and they base this from Genesis 1 and the evening and the morning were the first day. So with the Jews, Friday didn't start at midnight. Friday started at dark 
sunset on Thursday. So, Thursday night into Friday morning is night number one. Now we're in Friday. Christ is dead. He's in the to- his body's in the tomb. His soul is preaching the spirits in prison for day one. During this time, no corruption happens to his body. Nothing. No rigor mortis. Nothing. Then, at 6 p.m. Friday night, now we're into Saturday. So, night number two goes from Friday at 6 p.m. to Saturday morning at 6 a.m. That's night number two, and then that gives us day number two. Okay? Then, at 6 p.m. on Saturday, night begins at 6 p.m. Saturday, and that technically then is the first day of the week, because now it's Sunday, the first day of the week. So, night number three takes place here. Let me get my felt tip pen. Night number three begins right here, and then day number three has already been rolling since 6 p.m. the following night. So now we're into day number three, and Jesus rose early in the morning on the third day. Um, Turn your Bible to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Now, I'm going to get into the issue of the Bible says that the next day after Jesus was crucified was a Sabbath day. I'm going to get into that shortly. In Exodus 19, um, let's see here. Uh, Verse 10, the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So, if you look down in verse 15, he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. Verse 16, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning. So, a lot of things in the Bible started first thing in the morning. Okay? They rose up early in the morning. Um, I don't know how many times that's in the Bible. I I haven't looked at it. I just know that a lot of significant things that are in the Bible happened first thing in the morning, early in the morning, so on and so on. So you have a pattern there. Uh, Turn to Hosea chapter 6. Ezekiel. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, spelled J-O-S-E-A. He's Hispanic. He's the first Latin Jew in the world. Hosea chapter 6, um, if you look at verse 2, after, after two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So you have a pattern for resurrection here in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, that it takes place over two days and then on the third, in the third day, it doesn't say that the third day has to completely run out before it counts. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. And so Jesus basically, and he told this to the disciples, on the third day, uh, he, shall, he shall live again. On the third day, he kept saying that over and over, and it just went right over their heads. On the third day. So, crucifixion on Thursday. Now, the Bible says that the next day was the Passover, or no, excuse me, was the Sabbath. But, according to my calendar, the next day was Friday, not Saturday. What gives? 
Passover didn't start on a particular day of the week. It started on a date. The 14th day of the second month. So no matter what, where it fell in, it was 14th day of the, of the second month. So, or first month. So anyway, so this, at that year, the Passover uh, began on Friday. And that was the, because God said that that was a Sabbath day. Okay. The Feast of Tabernacles. On the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, that is a Sabbath. And then on the last day, it's a Sabbath. It doesn't matter where it falls, it's a Sabbath. And then the next day, Saturday, was another Sabbath. Because they observed, on this time, at this time, they observed two in a row. Yes, ma'am. Yes. The first, the first day of, of Passover was the Sabbath. The first day of the Feast of Weeks was the Sabbath. The first day of the Feast of uh, Tabernacles was the Sabbath. Okay, and God said it's a day of rest, and we're going to have a feast. Okay, uh, then they feasted for seven days. <sighs> Amen. Fried chicken for seven days in a row. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, and, and uh, green bean casserole. Corn casserole. So anyway, so crucifixion on Thursday. They got the body down before dark, laid it in a tomb. Night number one. Friday, Passover, because the beginning of, of uh, Passover, day one. Friday night is night number two. Crickets chirping. The next morning begins day number two. That night is night number three. And in the morning, day number three. Everybody got it? You want to take a picture of that, sell it on the internet, you're more than welcome to. All right, let's turn to book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Um, we started this last week. We learned who Theophilus was, kind of. He was uh, a man, probably, probably a wealthy man. Uh, but his name means lover of God. And um, we believe that uh, obviously he would have been a, a born again Christian. He knew of the life of Jesus and he wanted to know everything that happened. So Luke sat down and Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel are the two gospels that give us the uh, birth of Jesus. Mark and John they both begin at Jesus' baptism uh, when he was 30. Um, so then uh, Luke wrote the, uh, a historical narrative of the beginning of the church. So he says, and, and what happened with all the apostles and how they spread the gospel and so on. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach... Until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also, this is what I have up on the screen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. And again, if you were to take all of this uh, into a court and lay the evidence out, the historical documents out there you have to come to the conclusion that Jesus did in fact die uh, the da Vinci code brought in this uh, false teaching about Christ that Christ really didn't die he went into sort of like a coma that they had drugged him his disciples had drugged him to make this whole thing look like he died and rose again I'm not kidding and and so, believe it or not, when the Da Vinci Code brought this, I mean, I knew about that, that whole thing, that whole scheme, way before Da Vinci Code ever came out. When it came out, it basically popularized it. And the, the real theme of the Da Vinci Code, both the book and the movie, was basically to say Jesus wasn't really divine. His disciples, after, uh, after everything happened, 
made him into a god, but he wasn't really God. And that's what the teaching was. And, and people go, yeah, I kind of believe that. So now Jesus is not God anymore. And I'm like, he's not not God. If you understand that. So anyway, he's, he left many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, we're going to look at that, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. So, uh, the Bible says that from his resurrection, he spent 40 days just hanging around town. Um, we, don't, we don't have a record of all the things that he did. We don't have a record of most of the things that he probably said, we don't have a record of where he laid his head at night, if he even did. Uh, we just don't have a, a record of exactly what Jesus did in those 40 days. That's God's way of saying, it's not important, move on. Okay? Don't try to invent something that you think he would have done. That's not scripture. If scripture then tells us what he did in the 40 days, then we know it, and it's doctrine. But the Bible doesn't tell us. And so God says, don't worry about it. It's not important. Move on. So now we're at the end of the 40 days. And Jesus is gathered with his disciples, his apostles. And um, he tells them, don't leave, don't leave Jerusalem. Stay here. And wait, don't do anything, don't try to start something, you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not ready for it. If you'll wait, I will pour out my spirit upon you and you shall prophesy. And so he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So then we know from the end of the chapter that Jesus then ascended up into heaven. On, probably on that 40th day. His, his time is done and he goes up to heaven. So after that, does anybody know roughly how many days it would have been to the day of Pentecost? Huh? 50? The Pentecost was dated... From the Passover, I think. 50 days from that. So, he's taken up 40 of those days. Anywhere from, I'm going to guess, 5 to 10 days. Okay? So, they didn't have to wait very long. Uh, but during that time, we'll study this. During that time, uh, they realized that they're one apostle short. The number has to be 12, and there's a reason why. And so we'll get into all that as we move on. Uh, let's look at this 40 days tonight. Uh, if you were to take a guess or if you know, what do you think the number 40 represents? It's in a lot of places in the Bible, just the number 40. But the, the time frame of 40 days is also in a bunch of places. I mean, it's used significantly throughout scriptures. So what would you say the number 40 or the idea of 40 days meant? What did it, what did it represent? Why, what, why did he do it 40 days? Okay. You were shrugging your shoulders as you said it, so... I'm glad you uh, have it nailed down. Um, well, let's look at scriptures. Turn to Genesis 7. Genesis 7. So, how many days did it rain on the earth? 40 days and 40 nights. So, 
during this time, what's God doing to the earth? I mean, obviously, the water's coming down from heaven. Huh? Okay. Yeah. He is basically destroying everybody and everything. Uh, who knows, David, what all's buried in this world that if it were to be dug up, people would go, <gasps> Yeah, because the, the giants were in charge at that time and yeah, you got to think that they, with, the, with their size, they got a brain big enough and uh, with spirits, literally angels being their fathers, um, that they would be an advanced race of people or whatever. And so there's no telling um, what, you know, what lies buried because of the waters of the flood. Huh? Hollow earth? Um, I was going to say the the story of Atlantis does, to me, it speaks of the flood. Here you have this advanced civilization living on the earth. It's giants. And by the way, it's ruled over by ten kings. Does that sound familiar? Do what? Uh, we, the, here's what I'm going to say. The Bible doesn't say it, so it's not important. Yeah, uh, it could be, but it's one of those things that Bible just doesn't tell us. So again, that's God's way of saying it might be interesting, but it's not doctrine. It's not prophetic. Doesn't speak of what will happen. So during the 40 days, God is purifying the earth, isn't he? He's purifying it. He's scouring all the dirty people, all of the beasts, because all flesh had corrupted itself, the Bible says. And so they are literally, the earth is literally being cleansed of all of the evil that's on it, all of the, the filthy corruption that has covered the face of the earth. And so God, for 40 days and 40 nights, purifies this earth. Uh, now look at Genesis 50. See if we see a connection here. Uh, in Genesis 49, Jacob is prophesying over his 12 sons. And then in Genesis 50, he dies. And so uh, the custom of the Egyptians was that he was embalmed. And that's what it says here. The Bible says in verse 3, Genesis 50, And 40 days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. So, what is the embalming process all about? It's about removing from the body the things that will cause it to corrupt quickly and to halt the corruption process. Because the Egypt, we know what the Egyptians believe. The Egyptians believe that they're going to need that body because they got to cross this, the River Nile and all that stuff. And um, we know that's not true. But what they did was, and here's what I see in this, during this 40 days, they're purifying Jacob. They're cleaning his body inside and out because their embalming process not, not only involved uh, removing things in the body that would corrupt, but also cleaning and purifying the outside of the body. And so for them, that was a 40-day process. So we, we've, got, we've got a foundation here, at least, of, of what the Bible's saying about the number 40. Turn to Exodus 24 and 34. You might want to mark these in your Bible, and you do your own study. Maybe you'll come up with something different than me or better than me. I'm always open to that. Exodus 24, when Moses was called up to Mount Sinai uh, to receive the law, the Bible says Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Now, again, 
Could God have given him the Ten Commandments as soon as he crawled up there? Sure. What is God doing here? With these 40, why is he making Moses wait 40 days and 40 nights? Let's look in chapter 34. There's an extra thing added here. Verse 28. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. This is the second time he goes up to Mount Sinai. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Okay. So, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So, uh, apparently, the first time Moses went up, I would assume, although it's not spoken here, I would assume that he also did not eat or drink for those 40 days. Now, that had to be a supernatural event. You can go 40 days without eating. You cannot go 40 days without drinking water. It's not, you will die somewhere after four or five days. You're going to die. Your body's going to start shutting down. It needs constant hydration. We know that now. So it was a supernatural event um, that happened with Moses there. And God enabled him to not eat or drink water for 40 solid days. What would that have the effect of doing to Moses' body? Huh? Purification. He doesn't need a bathroom because he's not eaten or drank anything. He's not... So he is not defiled on the outside or the inside. Does that make sense? So I, I think we're looking at a, a, a purification... There is also, um, if, we, if we apply what Jesus said back in Acts chapter 1, or the idea that Jesus was around for 40 days, uh, it would seem that he's also sort of maybe in a purification process. I don't know. Um, but anyway, certainly Moses fits that description. Numbers 13. We're going to add something to this. And sometimes numbers will do that. They'll have multiple meanings based on the text. So in Numbers chapter 13, uh, if you remember from the Sunday morning sermons, Numbers 13 is where God told Moses to pick 12 men, one from each tribe. And God knew the outcome of this. God knew it. God knew how this was going to turn out. So it was no surprise to him. And so Moses picked these men. Their names start in verse 4, run down through uh, verse 15. And um, the Bible says that they were, let's see here, where is that 40 days? Anyway, the, the, in verse 25, they returned from searching the land after... 40 days. Now, 40 days, um, some, have, some have said, and I, I can see this, that 40 was a number for like probation, a testing number. Um, God knows the outcome of the test already, but he's showing us uh, whether or not we qualify or not, whether or not we have made it through probation. I, I watch some of these people show up in court and um, career criminals have been put, put on probation four and five times and they're still out violating, they're still out breaking the law and it's about time we have judges that say enough is enough, you're going to jail, how's that? You need to go to prison, serve your sentence. We obviously cannot um, probate you, we cannot reform you, and so you have to be punished for what you did. You have to be punished for your crimes, and so you're going to prison. Thank God we have some judges that still do that. 
Um, but anyway, um, here during these 40 days, these men are basically gathering information. And it's taking these men 40 days to reach their conclusion. At the end of 40 days, they come back and, they, and 10 of them said, our report is we can't go. Too many giants, too many high walls, too many big buildings. Uh, it's scary over there. They're going to eat us alive. And so no way, no how. And Joshua and Caleb, the only two that came back and said, of course we can go in there. God said we can go in there. So what was this? This was a trial here. This was a test period to see how these guys would reach their conclusion and what conclusion they would reach. And 10 of them got it completely wrong. And, um, oh, I don't remember if it was, I think if you look over in Hebrews Four, I think Hebrews 4 I was like stunned I did this study several years ago a guy provoked me to study the Giants and I did and um, let's see here oh I probably I probably can't find it real quick but anyway oh yeah yeah verse uh, chapter 3 um, if you look at verse 16, for some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So here in Hebrews chapter 3, we have uh, part of the doctrine of God's salvation of us. And everybody, I'm sorry, but everybody who names the name of Christ is going to go through a trial of your faith. Mark it down. Your, your faith and your trust in what God said is going to be put to the test. God is going to do it. And God already knows the outcome. So you say, why is God doing it? To show you why he's either selecting you or rejecting you. Depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I knew you not. And it has to do with the trial of our faith. It doesn't have anything to do with how many good works we do, how many sermons I preach, how many people listen to me. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with, do I believe what God said? And has that faith been tried? Yes. Several times. And I expect it will be tried several more. And so here you have that in Hebrews 3. And when I, when I realized... That part of the doctrine of God's salvation of mankind, uh, the justification for it came from what God did to those people in the wilderness who decided that they didn't believe God and they didn't trust what he said. And so they were going to stop and turn around and go back to Egypt again for the 147th time. And um, God said, okay... So for, for being there 40 days and come back saying you can't go in, everybody that fell for that, you're going to walk in the wilderness for 40 years. I'm going to feed you. Your shoes are going to stay on your feet. I'm going to keep you full of water. But you're going to die in the wilderness. You're not going to see the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb, out of the original group that came out of Egypt, were the only two that got to go into the promised land. Isn't that something? Out of over 600,000 adults that left Egypt, two of them. Now, the rest of the population was the children who were too young when they left Egypt and were at this time, or the children born in the wilderness. They got to go in. So anyway, we see here with Numbers uh, 13, they return from searching the land after 40 days, a, a trial period, and I, you could say literally another purification because what's God going to do with the entire population of the nation of Israel over 40 years? He's going to call them out. All the people that gave me trouble... I'm going to, they're going to die in the wilderness and I'm going to take a new generation in. Okay? 
Numbers 14. It says in verse 34, And after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities. Even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. God finally had to, he's been giving them grace all of this time and mercy. This ain't the first time they rejected God. This ain't the first time they said, we're turning around and go back to Egypt. But finally, when they got to this point, God said, enough is enough. You've rejected me for the last time. And so for that, you are not going to see the promised land. You're going to perish here in the wilderness. You're going to wither away. Your children are going to get to see it. But you're not going to get to see it. Period. So we can easily see how this number 40 still dealing with probation, trial, testing, purification. Uh, Jesus, one of the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And what that is, is God is always going to test our motives. Why are you here tonight? Why am I up here doing this? Is it so I can get popular on the internet and people watch me and I can feel good about myself? I love me. <laughs> Or um, is my motivation and my motives pure in that the only agenda that I have is to take what God has shown me and give it to you? What's your motivation for coming to church? What's your motivation for living for God? What's your motivation for wanting to serve Him for uh, all the things that we do? What is your motive for that? If your heart's not right, if your heart's not pure, God will know it. And God will show it to you. 1 Samuel 17, here's, here's an interesting one. Turn there. Talking about giants. This is 1 Samuel 17. If you want to mark this in your Bible, this is where Goliath is. Goliath was always one of my favorite stories. Because I was like fascinated with giants. Ooh. Samson, being six cubits in a span, works out to be something like over nine feet tall. And not just tall and lean and lanky like a basketball player. He's big like a gorilla. Okay? And this is not really told in Sunday school so much. But it's, to me, it's an important issue here is that uh, if, let's read this, start in uh, verse 1 of 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to D Judah and... Yeah, belongs to... Is he downstairs? Okay. Boy, he could not get me out of his mind, could he? Papa! Um, uh, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. So uh, if you look in verse 3, and the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them, neutral ground. This is how they fought battles back then. So you had the Philistines army over here, you got the Israel army over here and what is the Israel army doing? Nothing. They're doing nothing because they can do nothing. I have preached this before, and I've heard other preachers preach it before, that, you know, surely the, the armies of the living God should have got up and fought that rascal and defeated the Philistines. They couldn't. You've got a nine and a half foot Paul, beast. He is not only, like I said, he's not only tall, he is huge. He is, if you've ever seen a male silverback gorilla, they are a fierce thing. There's a reason why nobody has gorillas for pets. They are beasts. And when they, dis and who remembers 
CC Highway here, that lady that was keeping chimps, yeah, they'll eat your face off. Everybody thinks they're all cute and cuddly. You see them on TV, but they are, they are mean devils, and you never know what triggers them. So that's who Goliath is. He is a monster of a man, and he has, I mean, he has this huge sword. He is, he's got, uh, what is it called? A coat of chains, literally, yeah. Um, verse 5, he had a helmet of brass armed with a coat of mail, uh, which is chains, chain mail, get it? And, um, yeah, that's what, it's, that's what it is. It's chain mail. And uh, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. I don't know exactly how much that weighs, but that's got to be big. 5,000 pieces of brass in a bucket is going to be heavy. He carried that around like it was nothing. And so, who would think that they could go and defeat Goliath? Nobody. And that's the point. God gave them an enemy that was so big and so monstrous and so undefeatable. What you got, David? A thousand pounds. I don't see uh, Larry Bird or uh, Shaquille O'Neal carrying anything like that. Or Michael. It goes, that shows you how far back I am. LeBron, he don't wear no thousand pound coat. Now, Dennis Rodman might, but not LeBron. <clears throat> Man, I'm on tonight. But anyway, that shows you he was a monster of a, of a man. And, and that was the point. God made it impossible for them to win this battle on their own. It took a Savior. It took a David. One chosen by God. Which David now is a picture of Christ. He's a shepherd. The Bible says, uh, he defeat, and, and guess, who, guess who Goliath is? He's the Antichrist. Because David says he's like a lion and a bear. And that's the description of the Antichrist in Revelation 13. And so anyway, it, that David is a picture of Christ. And Christ is the only one who can defeat Goliath. You think, you think your sins are big? And you can't defeat them? Well, you're right. But God sent a man that could. Amen. But he came out every day, 40 days. What was going on here? We're purifying. We're, we've got everybody on probation. We're trying them. We're testing them. And so, again, it was at the end of 40 days. At the end of 40 days, God ended the floodwaters. At the end of 40 days, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. At the end of 40 days, the 12 spies come back. Uh, and then at, um, oh, look, I like this. First Kings 19, let me just read this very quickly for time. This is Elijah. Uh, he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink. I like this. And went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And so here is Elijah and the angels bring him food and he eats it and he drinks. He sleeps. Then he wakes up again. The angel woke him up, showed him some more food. Eat this. It's going to be a long time. And the Bible says that Elijah went in the strength of that one meal or that second meal, 40 days and 40 nights. And so again, he's not eating or drinking. So by the time he reaches Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, um, he's in a cave there. Is he pure now? After 40 days, you would think everything that he had in him would be out. And so it was. Um, when I see that, the strength of the meat, 40 days, I like what Jesus said. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. That's our food right there. And then Ezekiel um, 4. He was told to lay down for 40 days. As, uh, on his right side. And bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. And he accomplished that. We have 
uh, Jonah, who when he finally gets puked up by the whale, can you imagine that? You're in a pool of whale vomit. Ugh. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What's God doing for forty days? He's testing Nineveh. And did Nineveh repent? Yeah, God spared them. But it's at the end of 40 days. Then, finally, Luke 4. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, day 40, took him 40 days to get hungry. But he's very hungry. And remember, his body is weak. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't drank for 40 days. He's had no nourishment, nothing to eat. And the devil shows up and tempts him with food. Turn these stones to bread. You can do it. I know you can. I believe in you. And Jesus said, no. Gave him scripture. We know the other things the devil tempted him with. And here Jesus was weak. But he endured the temptation. Eve, under the same tests, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, was literally in a buffet of food, free food. She could drop her hand down and it land on something to eat. Okay, it's like Willy Wonka's candy room. Everything is edible there. And she is full. She has a full belly. And the devil tempted her with one more thing to eat. And she fell for it. She didn't need that. She was living fine. She had access to the tree of life. What did she need that one fruit? But it shows you what our nature is. We can get temporarily fulfilled with sin and then want more this body there is no end to the cravings of this body no end to it death destroys it finally death is victory for those who know the lord somebody say amen 40 days 40 days and so back in the book of acts chapter one, very quickly. Uh, Jesus has been 40 days speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And he tells them now that they're there to wait for the promise uh, of the Lord and that they will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, then afterward, and we're not going to get into that tonight, we're going to close here but um, as soon uh, he he's going to give them some last instructions they ask him a question about the kingdom and I'll touch on that maybe um, next Wednesday night we'll see uh, but he's going to he's going to tell them what's going to happen with the Holy Ghost and how how things are going to go after that and then uh, there is some some house cleaning that they've got to do at the end of the book of Acts, and there's a controversy. Uh, some people don't believe. They elected a new apostle, and there are some people who do not believe that Matthias was a legitimate apostle. Um, I don't see anything in Scripture that says that. Um, so that's my opinion, but we'll look into that when we, when we get that far, okay?